but no one's forcing Ross to do this. He's, he's willingly doing this, and I just think that is it's just bonkers. We're in a bit of a weird... They're rocks, then. He's in, like, a mental... No rocks. Slightly yeah. mental death spiral at the moment that we're trying to talk him out of. It's no longer a swoop. It's... it's... Oh. A war of attrition. Just come out the side and look in. He's not realised yet that he just needs to... Growing up, my dad used to always tell me stories of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, the, the race to the South Pole. Every footstep was just into the unknown. A part of me just has really been inspired by that. Currently, records for long distance swimming, you're looking at around 160 kilometers. Beyond that, every single stroke is, is just taking you into the unknown. When you're swimming up to those dark waters, people get scared, people get cold, people get tired. You know, people like Ross just keep going. They don't really care. And it's almost like, it's almost like you need to achieve this in your life or else life isn't worth living. So it's been four years now since I swam around Great Britain and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that I, I retired from ultra distance swimming, but I, I kind of semi temporarily hung up my goggles, just because it didn't feel right to continue to swim purely for records. And there's just been certain people that have completely redefined what we thought the human body was capable of. So Roger Bannister, four minute mile. Kipchoge more recently, the two hour marathon. A yeah, very good friend of mine, Eddie Hall, the 500 kilo deadlift. People just they just didn't think it was possible and in my small niche area that is floating and eating lots, I would love to see just how far we humans can, can actually go. Today, we did five 200 meter sets with him. At the end of those 200 meter sets, we took a blood lactate measurement. What that can tell us is fundamentally how physiologically challenged is he being by performing at that intensity. As lactate's accumulating, it's getting higher and higher. That's when we're getting further away from his aerobic energy systems. Being able to focus on what's a sustainable pace, what's going to be most fuelable is what's going to make him hopefully be successful in the world record attempt. One of the challenges of doing it in Scotland is that he's going to probably be swimming in about 15 degrees water. The previous world record was set in 20 to 22 degree water. When you see most open water swimmers, they do have relatively high body compositions because A, that helps with buoyancy. The more buoyant you are, fat floats, but also just having a little bit of extra insulation so when you're swimming, you're not losing as much heat and just makes it a little bit more sustainable in terms of performance as well. So the goal for this is really simple. I'll swim with no breaks, no sleep, no touching land for as long as I possibly can. Now, I'm not an endurance guy, but I've run like a 5K before, right, which took like 25 minutes. That was the longest 25 minutes of my life. 25 minutes is like a tiny little percentile of the stuff that Ross is doing. I think people frequently set their goals and their plans for themselves too low. They think people like Ross doing mad shit like this just gives people the belief that, hang on a minute, maybe I can do more than I thought I could do. Maybe I could achieve this goal they previously wouldn't have thought was possible for them to do. I'm often asked what the hardest thing about swimming around Great Britain was and then, Without doubt, the hardest point of the entire swim was, was Cape Roth. That was when I got a phone call from my older brother. And it was when we found out that my dad had um, terminal cancer. 
my initial reaction was just, just to call off the swim. I was, I was completely emotionally charged. I just, I just wanted to go and see him. And, and it, even in that moment, he was so selfless. And he just said, you can come home and you can come and be with the family and you can come and give me a hug, but it's got to be via Margate. You, you have to finish what you started. And, he, and so he made me promise. And, um, and I, I then swam around the top of Scotland and, and down the other side. Just just purely fueled on on the, the desire just to go and just, just wanted to give my dad a hug. Um, that was yeah, that was without doubt the hardest bit. Loch Ness is an incredibly dangerous place. I think one of the biggest mistakes anyone can make on these waters is underestimating how fast the weather and the water conditions can change. It's not uncommon to be out in flat, calm conditions and within 10 minutes, you're, you're in waves up to two metres. Knowing what Ross has done before, I would say if anyone was going to challenge Loch Ness, I'd say Ross is probably one of very few people on the planet that could actually do it. If anyone else had told me they wanted to try and go for this record in this body of water, I'd have thought they were joking. Near the edges, it could feel fairly warm, um, but as soon as you go over what people call the drop-off, just shelves away and with that the water temperature just dives as well. Look at what's ahead of it and you you take Loch Ness, the largest largest lake in the UK. That's not even been sort of swam around twice and Ross is looking to do that six times. Now of course you go, well yeah but you swam around Great Britain. That was intermittent. This is a this is a swim where there is no stopping. It's it's going all the way around it, and other things need to be taken into account, like water temperature and things like that, that are going to be factors into this. Once that cold creeps into your bones, you know that that cold, that deep cold that sets in. But when you're in the water, now your only choice is to keep going, keep going. That's it, and that's quite a scary thing. Potentially 72, 100 hours, as, as far as he goes, until either the lake, the weather, something else sh shuts him down. The thing that will be interesting to find out is, is where that shutdown point occurs. All swims and everything that I do now, I always just, uh, if, if I can display a fraction of that stoicism that my dad sort of taught me, then it's kind of the legacy, the hardest thing, probably the most valuable thing as well. I think it, I think it says a lot about who, who Ross is and what sort of person he is. Ross is doing something that no one else has ever done before, so literally he's going into these dark wars not knowing what's going to happen. Absolutely extraordinary. Going beyond what any human has ever done before. Just getting a last minute briefing. Yeah. I think as soon as I get in, it will be really feeling like the water, getting a sense of the surroundings, uh, temperature, uh, pacing, and feeding strategies as well. The first 10 hours, I hope, 
are just a filling out process. He's decided to go with one better. I had a rogue brioche bun for breakfast and we were swimming into 50 knots of wind, I was like, ah. But then James has nursed me back to health. The support team's been amazing. I was I was in a bad way. I'm I'm not even gonna lie. But now it's now it's fine. Don't eat before you go swimming because you'll cramp up and drown whatever, you know. If I'm thinking of two things that go in unison, eating 15,000 calories and swimming in a lake. It just doesn't make sense. I don't think that makes sense. Breakdown of the nutrition is really simple. It's just 120 grams of carbohydrates every hour on the hour. Uh, that's basically the upper limits of what the human stomach can digest. So you want to optimally hit that just like clockwork. Could James prepare another noodles for Ross and a French brioche? You need to have that fuel. If you don't have the fuel, then it's game over. The body's feeling great, shoulders are great. It was just my stomach. My stomach was like, what are you doing? But, you no, know, I'm just trying to... I know it's easy to talk about seasickness and stuff like that, but what a swimming pool. My, my dad loved Scotland. Me and my mum, we had a bit of the moment where we, uh, we looked at each other and was like, this, this feels a little bit like a dad swim. As soon as it gets dark, your circadian rhythm, you know, your body's 24 hour biological clock. In my experience on my longer swims, it's all of a sudden that the body and the brain start saying, you should be asleep right now. Or I was like, well, why are you in Loch Ness? And you almost have to like biohack that. Say, look, I know this is a little bit strange, but stay with me and almost ask the, the body and or the brain to cooperate. Everything has become significantly harder as the light's gone, so navigating, like seeing Ross, when you look out, you have to really look for him. You know, we're over 12 hours now, 13 and a half hours in. Just a case now of long, a long, long slog in the dark. Gonna go across now and then down more. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to come up and we're going to go back on the North Shore. When it starts raining, be happy because that's when the rain stops, the wind stops. I'm already wet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, you, if you go into a night swim in a bad mood, you can come out in a terrible mood. And it's, it's knowing that the mind is almost like, like an untamed horse. It's so powerful. And if, if you can tame it, that's great. But if you let it run wild, then, not to sound too dramatic, but it kind of will destroy you. You know, the swim will come collapsing down from, from the inside, basically. There's your drink. Energy gel there. Yeah. Energy gel's there, it's open for you. Got it? All right, go. Turn clockwise, spin it clockwise. Morning, how are we doing? Yeah, good bro, how are you? We're still, we're still out here, we're still going. 
we're currently doing loops in the bay next to Urquhart Castle because Ross's shoulders, uh, he's just got a bit of cramp and we're finding it out in the middle of the loch. Anytime we stop, it takes so much time to do all the food and change of things because it's just, it, it was so choppy, it's calmed off now. Um, and that cumulative time is killing Ross's average pace, like killing it. Ross has hit, definitely hit like the lowest point so far mentally, I think. You can't really trust your own thought process. You, you're so tired, you're so cold. You, you almost have the cognitive functioning of a five-year-old. You know, so you, you really need to look at your team and just know that they're the ones who are gonna make the decisions for you, whether you like it or not. As far as we know, no one's ever done more than two lengths. So he's probably already done the best part of the second length in laps, here, just in here. But if we can get him down there and he starts again, that's a, that's a milestone. It's like, okay, you've gone further in Loch Ness than anyone else ever has before. It's not a small thing. I can't actually string any swims together. What, um, there was no schedule, but. I had a schedule and I'm way behind it. So what should have been a 60 hour swim is now turning into well, a hundred and beyond. I think tonight's going to be a real test of whether the water temperature is going to be the thing that really makes this the toughest thing he might ever have done, to be honest. And it, it's definitely having an impact on our man. He's he's feeling it, and it's um, it's, it, it's hurting. Beyond 24 hours, that's when things start getting a little bit cheeky. So 36 hours in, start hallucinating, as sports scientists call it, perceptual distortions. The, the cognitive decline at that point is so steep. Like you, you're really not thinking straight and you're almost swimming through syrup at that point. Everything's just slowing down. I will never ever bet against Ross. He surprised me so many times when you think, you know, that's not possible for a human to do, he does it. So I will not put any odds against him, but I think this is, a, this is definitely a critical night and it's gonna be a long one. My dad was such a mentor. If ever I had an issue with anything, I would just always go to him for, for anything and everything. And, and now he's no longer here, I sort of find myself trying to make sense of the world without him. I think for so long I was, I was just an athlete. So I, just, I just wanted to win. I just wanted records, I wanted trophies. That, that's, it was very extrinsic, my form of motivation. And it's only now seeing my dad's legacy that if I could achieve a fraction of that, then that, that's a life well spent, trying, trying to, to aim for that. to kind of keep keep everything efficient and try and get Ross to Fort Augustus by sunrise. Um, that's the idea anyway. Um, hey guys, it's uh, half one in the morning out here. In the darkness of the night, Ross has started hallucinating. Um, he stopped about 15 minutes ago to ask if anyone else can see the dog. The medic's going to get a list of questions for us to ask him just to check his, his mental state. But um, yeah, he started seeing things out here in the night. It would be remiss to sort of ignore the fact that no, no human has ever done 
what he's looking to do, that with that comes, you know, risk. And it is easy sometimes to fall into assuming everything's okay because he's this high energy, super positive character. And so it probably does rely on the support team around him to be going, actually, is this a good decision for Ross? Is this good for Ross? Is, is, is this time now to, to, to sort of say stop? Out of five. Well, I mean, I know everything that's wrong. So how are you feeling? Say for the first time on this trip so far, um, Damo the medics had to uh, to come into play, just uh, making sure we're checking in on Ross's cognitive function, checking his memory, checking his, his his response to questions, and checking his temperature. But all signs so far are still good, despite a couple of minor hallucinations. Ross is lucid, switched on, and not hypothermic, which is great news for everyone, but especially for Ross. It's been two years now since my dad passed away and the, the whole experience just, it, it just shifts your barometer as to what you think suffering is. You know, that, that I'll be out there 48 hours in, cold, you know, trench foot, tongue falling off you know, and stuff. And it's just like, that's, that's not, it's not suffering. It's not, you know, it's not in the scheme of things. In comparison to somebody who's bedridden terminal cancer, they would 100% put themselves in my shoes rather than be where they are. You know, you know it's, 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 it's all relative. And when you've actually seen that with somebody you like you care about and love, you go, it's, this isn't that hard. It's, you know, it's, yeah, in the scheme of things, it's not. Everyone on the support boats is uh, remarking how it's crazy that we've, we've done shifts, we've taken turns, we've had meals. Some people have gone off to have a shower and a sleep for a few hours. Um, every time you look across, you look across, he's been doing stroke after stroke after stroke, non-stop, no break, no sleep, no rest. Since 9am, two days ago now, um, it puts it all in perspective and uh, it's pretty hard to be honest. If I could ever do anything in, in, in my chosen sport with the skills that I have, which like I said is just is floating and eating, um, that'd be really cool. And, and uh, yeah, it would just, that's, yeah, it's just, it's, it sounds really cheesy, but like in so many ways, it, dad just showed me kind of, yeah, how to live and, and how to die. And I don't want that last bit to sound morbid, but but when he died, he left such a legacy. And then ultimately that's, that's gonna come to all of us. And if you can turn around and go, the world's a bit of a better place because I was in it, then that's wicked. I've lost second time. Is it the second night tonight? Just oh! <laughs> Genuinely lost track of time. Um, if I sound funny, it's because I've got so many ulcers in the inside of my mouth. And whatever's in Loch Ness isn't entirely clean. So there's all sorts going on. And I think it's that, that is Ross's unique characteristic, is no matter how hard it gets, he always sees the positive. It's thrown so many curveballs. Uh, not necessarily amazing, but I mean, what started out as a, as a meticulously planned swim uh, has just, oh, hang on, sorry, Chris. 
he will he will look out 4 a.m. and be glad that the rest of the stars are out, even though that makes it five degrees colder. He will be grateful for um, any number of things that a normal person would turn around and, and see as a negative. Ross will turn it. I don't, even, I don't think he even turns it. It just is a positive to him. I think he's an endlessly positive person. Oh, that was a bit of my tongue. Oh, sorry. No, no. He's here. Uh, what started out as a, a meticulously planned swim has just uh, has had so many curveballs thrown at it. And I mean, that's that's the nature of, of adventure swimming, but... And where many athletes try and train that to become, become that positive person, I think Ross just has it built into him. Started off with a, a rogue brioche bun that, that just flipped my stomach upside down. And then we swam into the night in 20 knots of wind and, and that combination was not, not good. So the first six hours were ropey and now we're playing catch up and, and that's fine, but uh, it's no longer a swim. It's, it's a war of attrition. You know, it, it's, uh, I said in one of my books that resilience is suffering strategically managed and that's exactly what we're doing now. Sea ulcers, inside, lining of your mouth, coming out, chafing, uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, I keep speaking to people on the lock and I'll go like, oh, I didn't know people let their dogs roam there. And they're like, there's no dogs there. I'm like, I swear I could see dogs. So, <clears throat> The, uh, the body and the mind are, are malfunctioning, basically. It's, it's got a rough start. Everything's now been pushed back and, oh, realistically, could be 72, could be 100, but mission brief. I think anything that we can offer him is going to be purely like a placebo effect for him. If we can tell him that it might work, it might buy some time. But fundamentally, you know, he's, he's here for a four-day swim and it's, it's going to hurt. He's going to suffer. And yeah, he's not got a chance to heal. But we're, come, we're going to come to a point where there's just nothing left to try. He's going to have to accept that it's going to hurt. Over. If I were to ask you just to sit in that chair for 72 hours and not fall asleep, I can or a thousand percent guarantee you will fail. And to think that you're gonna go out and fuel your body and, and dive into that water and just non-stop, stroke after stroke after breath after breath, just keep going for 72 hours is absolutely insane. It would drive you insane if someone forced you to do it. But no one's forcing Ross to do this. He's, he's willingly doing this. And I just think that is, it's just bonkers. It's Ross, it's Ross all over. Hey guys, so um, the medics had to call it. He was basically going off, going off a cliff edge down into hypothermia. He stopped being able to swallow at all and was struggling really to breathe and get enough through his airways. And if you can't get the fuel in, if you can't get the calories in, and certainly if you can't get enough oxygen in, you know, your body is just gonna lose temperature so fast. And all the signs were there that that was happening. So it was a pretty quick, pretty brief discussion uh, between Ross and Damo and they pulled Ross out of the water. I don't want to say grateful for the time to reflect, but with, with nothing else to do but be hooked up to a drip and, and sort of fed antibiotics, it, it really allowed me to, to just deconstruct what had just happened. 
it was it was quite I mean, it was a heavy experience because I was actually put in the cancer ward as well. And I'm I'm sitting there in this this cancer ward speaking to these amazing people who, despite everything's against them, they're they're still just so stoic. And I, I, it was in that moment I just realised I'm I'm probably going to walk out of here as soon as the antibiotics kick in and cellulitis is under control. Some of them might not. And that was so, like I said, it was heavy, it was humbling, and it just it it just makes you realise that as much as you think you're suffering, or even other people think you're suffering, you're not. Like there's, there's there are people far worse off, and I think knowing that again, that barometer of suffering, it just um, it can it it's humbling but it can make you incredibly grateful as well like as, as as hard as this was and although i've still got scars from this swim i'm so grateful that i got to walk out of it because like i said some of the people they, they don't to be honest with you now there's times i'm in a bad way but we were doing social media live events and as soon as the camera was on me, I was like, now you have to talk about charity elements. Like that, that's what you've got to do. To put, put aside all, everything else. And I think that's that's something that, um, yeah, I think uh, upon reflection, that's what dad would have probably been so happy about. Like, you spoke so well, you handled the event really well. You made everybody feel welcome. You're very polite. And uh, at the end, probably wouldn't have cared about distance, swum, duration in the water. It's just how you handle yourself. And I think uh, that's why even now I look back on this swim quite fondly because as I sort of mature and get a little bit older, the, the sort of metrics of success aren't just distance and duration, but what impact did you have on everybody? You know, what, what have you produced and what did you put out into the world? It's not a record, it's not a distance time it's, it's it's something else so i think i think there's that which only now i'm beginning to understand what my dad meant all the time ago. he did not look like a human being he looked like a gargoyle off the side of a you know notre dame or something the man was literally gray um his, his skin looked like it was made out of stone no one's done what ross has done here and I don't think anyone ever will replicate what Ross has done here. I mean, yes, he didn't achieve what he was set out to do, but nobody can. Nobody can swim that length in here. You can't do it. I think so often an adventure gives you what you need, not necessarily what you want. What I mean by that is what I wanted to do was to break records for the longest humans ever swam with records and metrics. But what I probably needed to learn was some humility, uh, purpose, and what's important in life. And I know that sounds quite cheesy, but um, I think, uh, yeah, like I said, on this particular adventure, I certainly didn't get what I wanted. But upon reflection, I think I got what I needed. Yeah, swim around Great Britain swim the channel to in a log, push a mini for a marathon. You know, there's just one of many absolutely fucking ridiculous things that Ross the Labrador Edgley does in his life. So what is next for Ross Edgley? <laughs>